This is the Houndsman XP Podcast. Good dog, get that bear. Get that bear in here. The original podcast for the complete houndsman. The podcast that represents our lifestyle of extreme performance. Get up there! Get him! Get him! Yeah! Good boy! Good boy, Ranger! Uniting houndsmen across the globe from east to west, north to south. You know, if you're going to catch a cat or a lion, you know, you have to have teamwork. We take you to the wildest places on earth. Yeah, so how many days? How many days a week you spend out there? As much as I can, to be honest with you. Any time that I get, I'm I'm out there. Join us for every heart pounding adventure on Houndsman XP. I'll tell you like I tell everyone else. I'm gonna hunt whether you're here or not. So you might as well be here. <laughs> Welcome to the Houndsman XP podcast, everyone. We're glad you're tuning in again this week. And I'm really excited to have you here with us. I'm going to take these glasses off because you don't need to see that halo ring. I turn on all the filters and stuff to make this beautiful face acceptable for you. So I am happy to be back in the driver's seat after a few weeks of break there uh we're we're back in full swing with the houndsman xp podcast now and um i am excited to have one of our friends from australia on this episode of the podcast and uh ned makem you heard him previously seth and chad interviewed ned uh probably a year ago or so and a great podcast. We just dropped it again a couple of weeks ago. So I strategically contacted Ned and we're going to talk about something. We're going to talk about pig hunting, of course, hog hunting. But uh, we're also going to talk about an effective organization. And I think it's timely that we're having this conversation now because the National Houndsman, Associ- uh, National Houndsman Alliance, it's so new, I don't even know the name of it. National Houndsman Alliance is organizing right now and getting ready to roll. And uh, a lot of good stuff is coming about with that organization. And Ned's going to help us navigate some of that stuff, why it's important. Ned's been involved with an organization over there for the last 20 years. He's the president of that organization in Australia. And really the struggles between what we face here in the United States and what Ned deals with every day and our, our brethren from Australia deal with every day is not that much different. So I'm super, super happy to have him on the podcast. Before we get there, I got to give a shout out to our sponsors, this new format. I got to give them to you up front. And uh, first thing I want to talk to you is about <coughs> is Onyx, Onyx Maps. If you go to the Houndsman XP website, and click on our sponsors page, you'll see Onyx there. And you, if you haven't done so yet, if you're not using Onyx, then I'm going to tell you that it's replacing some of the mapping cards and some of the old technology. I use that thing all the time. If I'm trying to orient myself in a new hunting spot, then I pull up Onyx and I look at it. I can get all kinds of features within that map. I can track myself on trails, marked trails when I'm out west, and, and it saves a lot of my time there of trying to trying to learn a lot of that stuff. Uh, it gives us landowner information. It gives us terrain features. You can mark sign. You can you can uh, mark places where you maybe you catch a bear in the backcountry and, and you want to know where you caught that bear and share it with your friends. You can actually do all of that within Onyx. So go to Houndsman XP Podcast houndsmanxp.com, click on the sponsors link, go in there, click on Onyx. And if you haven't done so yet, sign up and put in the promo code HXP20 and you'll get 20% off of your subscription to Onyx 
know where you stand with Onyx. Elite Nutrition, I can't tell you guys enough. I got I, Man, I'm so happy. I'm so grateful to all of you who have been ordering Elite Nutrition products from our website at houndsmanxp.com. I've said this before. I told Chip Kozier this. He's the sales manager, regional or national sales manager for Elite. And when he was trying to get me to come on board and sell Elite Nutrition products, I just flat told him that I was not selling snake oil for him. I had to try it first. I had to look at it. I had to put it through my hands. I had to see the results, and I've done that. I'm using Essential Dog. I use the uh, the Rebalance BB, uh, Canine Guard, and um, uh, Happy Dog Plus, all great stuff. And if you need more information, check out our YouTube channel. We're running down all that stuff about Elite Nutrition products. It really is a high-quality product that's going to, kickstart your dog's natural system to start absorbing all of those nutrients from the dog food. So you're actually going to have less, less feed consumption. You're going to have better body condition. You're going to have less cleanup after your dog's elite nutrition. If you want to be extreme performance houndsman, you need elite nutrition. And last but certainly not least is Cajun Lights. Cajun Lights is another product. I don't sell you anything I don't use. I use Cajun Lights L.W. Nixon was just at Autumn Oaks, and he was actually set up with the Elite Nutrition booth there and Chip Kozier, and they teamed up. And so I'm sure you reached out to him and met him there. But L.W. and Cajun Lights is just a great company. I use their lights. It's totally backed by great customer service, and it's just cutting-edge type technology for, for your coon hunting lights. And don't just think it's a coon hunting light. I use the micro gator when I'm big game hunting. Early in the morning, I'm out looking for tracks. I can throw that micro gator out the window. Uh, it's already mounted on my head. I can look out the window. I can see tracks. I can get out of the truck. I've already got the, the light on my head. I'm ready to go. And then when it gets light out, I can just take the cap light off, stick it in the back seat, put another hat on my head. I'm ready to roll. So check out Cajun Lights. You can find them on our website, too, or go to CajunLights.com. Check out all their information. All right, that takes care of paying the bills. Let's get to our guest, the wonder from down under, Ned Makem. <laughs> there he is. Yeah, that's you, quite an intro. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us, Ned. Tell us where you're at in Australia. Uh, I live in a uh, what to you guys would be a little town um, called Inverell in uh, the northern part of uh, the state of New South Wales. So it's um, it's where I was born. I lived here for 20 years, went away for 20 years, and I've been back for about 24 years, 25 years. So um, great hunting country, great fishing country, um, and our uh, our family was among the first settlers were first white settlers of this area in the 1800s. No yeah. So when, um, when Doc Holliday was running around causing trouble, my great grandfather was farming here. He, and he <laughs> was a, uh, he, he had been a cop. Um, and here that was like, he was at a, a, an area called Hay, which is on, um, it, it's such a big flat area. It's actually called the Hay Plain of Western New South Wales. And, he had a uh, an Aboriginal tracker uh, who, unusually for the time, um, uh, our great grandfather armed him, um, which was a, a remarkable show of equality and good sense at the time. Mm -hmm. There'd be two of them just going out into the into the bush, uh, tracking down the bad guys and mostly bringing them back alive, but occasionally there were mishaps. You know, right. so yeah, it's I feel quite quite um a part of the landscape here and um I, I guess it's one of the reasons I, I don't exactly know why i enjoy hunting so much but i just do i try to explain it to people but it's fairly pointless you either love it or you don't um it's not a casual thing for me it's been my whole life so right yeah well you guys are actually a lot of people i i forget about it all the time you guys are going into your winter or your summertime there while we're getting ready to go into our fall season 
So yeah. you're actually breaking into spring. So you're coming off of a long uh, season of hunting. Yeah, well, the it's, it's hunting. Hunting's all year round here. Um, mm-hmm. It's just that, and we're in springtime. It's a it's a cracking good morning here. Um, I love the springtime. It's my favourite time of year. But uh, for pig hunting with dogs, depending on where you are, the cooler months are better, uh, right. of course. Um, and you know, we do get snow and things like that in Australia. There's cold areas where I. Um, where I live, it can get quite cold at night, like properly cold. Um, uh, so I, I guess centigrade um, um, temperatures won't mean much, but, uh, you know, it can be minus five, minus seven. That's probably in the 20s uh, Fahrenheit. Yeah, right. uh, it can get lower than that. It can, it's been down to the coldest morning I've known in this area was minus 16, which would be probably down to 10s. Um, so it's much better for the dogs, pretty hard on the hunters, but it's much better for the <laughs> dog, of course, because they don't, uh, they don't overheat as much, you know, overheating I saw, back to here. I was snooping around on your, uh, Facebook posts and you were talking about cold temperatures and different things. And, and, uh, I was just curious what that was, you know, what is cold temperatures in New South Wales, Australia? And, uh, yeah, I, it was interesting. It, well, and the other thing is, it's um, see, it, Australia is about the same size as land mass as the United States, but we've only got six states and two territories, so they're big. Um, like, you know, Texas is a big state; it wouldn't uh-huh. be remarkable. It wouldn't be remarkable here. Right. Um, every, everywhere is that big. So, and almost no people compared to the US. You know. Um, yeah. So we've only 24 million or something like that. That's a city, uh, like that's Los Angeles or something, you know. So there's a lot of um, um, a lot of big Sounds open like spaces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, except there's no bears, thank God. But the um, whenever we watch alone or something like that, we're just going, why would you be camping out where there's bears? There's just bears, just so terrifying to us. Um, you know, people see Australia as a dangerous place, and I've had that conversation with with Americans before. They're going, "But well, what about the snakes?" And I said, "Well, you've got to muck around with a snake to get bitten. Mostly, it's very rare that it's like snakes aren't looking to eat you. The only thing here that's yeah. looking to eat you are crocodiles, and they are absolutely yeah. hunting you. Um, but you know where they are, and mostly they're in the water. But um, I always says that you guys have got bears. Like, gee whiz." That's a that's yeah. a horrible proposition to me, and the fact that you hunt them with dogs, I think that's just fantastic. I've got um, uh, yeah, Chad is a, a, a bloke I, I rate highly. I, I met him over there on a visit in two thousand and eleven, uh, and I love his videos of um, uh, of, of treeing bears and cats and mm-hmm. things like that. I just think that's magnificent. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a, a it's just what you get used to, Ned. You know. It, mm. People think about it's just like the weather, you know. Yeah. If you yeah, sure. if you live if you live at the North Pole, minus sixteen centigrade, isn't that cold? You know. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so it's it's just what you get used to. Same with wildlife and different things like that. Um, I'll tell you what, though the the way you the way you hunt hogs, that's not for the faint of heart. Walking in and lugging a hog and. And take the oh yeah, and... look the, the the it depends what you're running to. Like if you're what you call bay dogs, we call bailers. They're bailing up the pig, and your dogs are baying the pig. It's that's the same thing. Um, and what we'd call a hard finder. All of our dogs are supposed to find. We don't have mm-hmm. you know a team of finders and then a team of hard dogs because um, we, at as a nation, we like to, we like to be capable of all things at all times. We we haven't got many people, so we've got to be able to. Your mechanic has also got to be a good cook, you know. So, <laughs> so we're trying to, um, you know. So we'll have hard finders or we'll have bailers, and there can be hard bailers. That'll be a dog that will stop a pig by nipping it um, mm-hmm. and make it turn and wait, and then they'll they'll uh, bail it up. Or hard finders just you know what we'd call wind the pig smell the pig off the buggy or the ute or the, the like the pickup 
as you're right. driving around and they'll just go and they might go, um, you know, between half a mile and a mile, they might go further and they'll just grab the pig when they get there. So really? I'm 64. So, so what kind of dogs are those that are your hard finds? Oh, look, there's various types, but they're mostly crossbreds. Um, They've got uh, bulldog in them, or are they running, running catch dogs? They stag. What? What do you? Well, what, what whatever you people have got access to. Um, whatever uh, a good friend of mine in the states once said, Australia's Australians could be given a dog designed by NASA, and they'll just cross it with whatever they've got their hands on at home. It's we don't care so much. Like there are catahoulas and blackmouth curs and things here. They've been imported, but. Um, People here will hunt with what with what they can get their hands on. They'll get them out of the pound and see how they go, you know. Yeah. Um, and in my experience, all dogs will react to a pig. Some of them don't want anything to do with it, but they're all interested in what a pig's doing. And it might be just that the dog's going, right, I'm out of here, I don't like that thing. Or they'll want to investigate it. Um, and so a dog that's a hard finder, like the ones that we use, Oh, we've had that blood in the yard since 1986, and they go back to English Bull Terrier. Um, yeah. Like pits, what you guys might mm -hmm. call bulldogs. They're, that's, right. um, they're not as big a, a deal here. There's pe plenty of people like them, um, but the, the old baselines of hard finders were built on English Bull Terrier and, um, say, Wolfhound or Deerhound, um, yeah. you know, Dane. Um, because, it, like, uh, in Mastiff, that sort of thing. So if you get enough of those crosses, what happens, and if you're selecting for ability, they all end up looking much the same. Right. Because the body type um, that works tends to be, you know, generally athletic. Um, uh, you want them as reasonably quick as you can. But the, the main thing, another wise old man, he's an old man now, but he said, you, you can't ever see what's in here. And it was you can't see what's, <laughs> what the heart is in a man or a dog, and you've got to chase that heart. It's got to be a willingness yeah. to engage and to stay with the pig. So, um, yeah, I, I was saying, going to start before. I'm a 64 year old man, so I'm not running many places. Um, I also <laughs> like well, until recently, I like to drink. Um, so that generally isn't a, a great recipe for athleticism. I used to be quite athletic. But as you get older, um, I went through a real ego challenge where I had to go, I'm not getting to those dogs quick enough. That's not fair on them. Um, and so I changed from I was just all hard finders, you know, and they were, um, you know, they did their job. Lots of lots of very good hard finding dogs in Australia, lots of them. Um, I, sh I shouldn't leave out uh, bull Arabs, people um, – they, they were bred by a con man in, in the beginning, or the name was created by a con man. However, um, some good breeders got onto the concept, uh, and there's a lot of good dogs. Um, and what do you call yeah. them? You call them bull Arabs? Bull Arabs. So that's just okay. that's a made-up name. Like, Well, any name's a made-up name. But sure. um, the guy in the 70s, when I was a kid, he was hawking these dogs around, you know, oh, these are the greatest dogs, and he was he was a con man. Um, he might still be alive, so I'll possibly get into trouble for that. But um, he's been in all sorts of trouble for, you know, having 50 dogs in a house yard and all loose and shit everywhere and all that sort of thing. Um, right. But anyway, but some good – the idea was very good. Um, and he'd named heaps of breeds. He'd, he'd, he'd cross two dogs that he had and he'd say, oh, this is the so-and-so breed, the Alano breed or the uh, – the, um, no, he had heaps of them. I can't remember them all now. But some good breeders got hold of the concept and there's a lot of um, bull Arabs and they were the original base, as I recall it from dealing with it when I was younger, um, was Greyhound, English, Bull Terrier uh, and Pointer. That was the cross. And so you ended up, ended up with a um, – his marketing was fast and hard and could find, you know. Um and that's they vary though now, like they are all sort of a. So say that again. Say that again, Ned. You what was that? Bird English dog? bull terrier. English bull terrier was yep. uh, the base. Uh, pointer. Pointer. Um, pointer and greyhound. 
Okay, so you got that's quite a mix. You got yeah. catch, you got nose and s- stamina, and you've got yeah. speed. Yes. So that was his marketing ploy. There's been various other things. Different breeders might have added their own little touch. Um, mm-hmm. But see, we, it's a controversial position. But you'll get a good, a really good finding dog out of a straight cross with an English bull terrier because um, all dogs can smell a pig. Like pigs aren't hard to smell. But what it is is a what you're looking for is the the obsession to get to the source of that smell. So if you cross an English bull terrier um, and something with legs, um, there's a just as good a chance of you getting a good finding dog out of the will of mm-hmm. the bull terrier. So, and you'll see that on a tracker. You'll see a dog that's a certified top finding dog with the right finding breeds in it, and you'll see a dog that's a, from a, a crossbred line that finds if they've got high bull terrier content. Um, you'll see the on the tracker you'll see where the um the pointer style might be following the tracks of where the pig's Mm -hmm. gone but the bull terrier type will run in a big arc because they're wind setting as they go and their objective is to get there they're they're not they're not motivated by the oh i've centered something here and i've sent it they're just going it's in this (laughs) direction you know we're going forward um now that's not universally um, accepted here. That's what I've found in my experience. Um, we don't have any finding breeds in our dogs at all, um, and they'll find like crazy, you know. Um, but I've had to change then to add in bailing dogs. That was the point of that story um, because I'm, it was unfair to my dogs. They were getting bashed by the pigs, and I'd be hobbling up there going, yes, well, good work, Alan, you know, good work, but Clyde. and. Right. Uh, then you're having to fix them up and I just felt it was I felt that my ego not wanting to say I'm now too old to do that effectively was getting in the way of the welfare of the dogs so I um I was converted by a good friend of mine who you would know even though you don't uh, realize it but you remember the the video of the guy punching the kangaroo yeah the guy that was uh boxing the kangaroo yeah, so that's him. That's the guy that got me. Uh, that's Greg Tonkins. He's one of our committee members. And um, great guy, good dog handler, very good dog handler. Um, was that a serious Was that a serious video? I mean, he r- really went out there and confronted the, the kangaroo. Oh, yeah. He was, that yeah, wasn't yeah. a stage deal, right? Oh, no. No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're not a thing you want to play with. Like, you don't right. – they'll hurt you properly. Yeah. Um, and that dog – I know that dog, and it's definitely not a roo chaser or anything like that because they're bycatch. You know, they're they're. Um, I guess, uh, uh, you know, you, you, that's what you, that's how you you, you you trash break in the states, right. as I understand right. it. So um, we we stock proof and roo proof dogs, <clears throat> and that that uh, that dog he, he's a great dog. He's still alive, but. Um, from what I saw of it, because I saw a bit more of the video, he's run onto that roo camped. The roo's just camped under a tree. Um, uh, and they'll just lie down like a man with their sort of arms crossed and looking about. He would have run straight onto that, that roo as he's on his way to a pig. And, of course, a, a roo will defend itself immediately. So it just stood up and grabbed the dog. And you can see in the video the dog's not being aggressive. It's just standing, especially as Tonks runs in. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, he he's just instinctively um, he's instinctively <laughs> thrown a punch. Um, that was great. That's that's been enough to sort of make the roo go. Okay, we're in a fight. And then he's yeah. as soon as the roo's let go of the dog, it's gone. Because if you've got them broken well and they're well balanced dogs, they know we're in the wrong place, and they're just going right. We're out of here. You know. Nothing good's going to happen here. So then anyway, Tom's sure. back off and that was good. But anyway, he's the guy who got me on to bailing dogs and he sent me um, a, a, a good prospect early on, uh, a, uh, a like a collie cross, like a, a probably a Kelpie collie cross or something like that, sheepdog, um, uh-huh. called Baz. And Baz, you know, Proceed, I took him out, proceeded to round up mobs of pigs and stand there and look at me. He could find really well and he'd bail them up. 
Um, then I got another one, a Kelpie called Wall, who was dynamite, and uh, eventually grass seeds killed him. So a lot of our grass seeds um, in native grasses have got awns on them that make them go into fur yeah. and they'll sit in there. Sometimes they can migrate inside the dog, but if a dog's running around with its mouth open, you know, breathing heavily and it's running through long grass, it can ingest them into their lungs and if you don't catch it, and I didn't, um, eventually it can kill them and it killed him. Yeah, we have the uh, same problem with foxtail here. Yeah, yeah, it would be the yep. same style of thing, I'm sure. Yep. Yeah, as um, soon as it starts going in, it's got barbs in it, so it just yeah. keeps, you know, when the muscle going. moves, when, yeah, when the muscle yeah. moves, when the skin moves, and it goes a little deeper, and it, yep. I mean, it can migrate all over a dog. Yes, it's hideous. It's a, the, the, there's a lot of ways dogs can can die. Um, yeah. And but anyway, um, but then I got another one from him called Ghost. Um, and so there's Ghost and Baz now, and and of uh, we've bred, we've bred a couple of our own little finders now, out of some Kelpies that my Kelpies are a sheepdog, an Australian British sheepdog, um, super smart, really really smart. You could you could teach them to type, like they're just they're very they're a very clever dog, and they adapt. Some some Kelpies will just show a predisposition for pigs. So we got one given to us. Because I got a phone call from a pig chaser I know and respect, and he said, um, "He said you want a dog," and I said, oh, "I'm always interested in a dog, but what's going on?" He said, "Oh, you know, he, one of his relatives had a, a sheep dog that refused to work sheep, but kept um, taking all the dogs to big boars. He'd just find a big boar and just stay at it, you know." Mm. And I said, "Yes, we'll, we'll definitely take that dog," and that was just a predisposition that dog had. And so what happens in Australia is you get a few of those together. <coughs> pardon me, because there's plenty of pigs here. Um, you'll, you'll get almost any dog will show a predisposition. I've got a great video of a little um, Jack Russell Terrier. I don't know if you guys have those, but yep. a little dog about this big. Um, yep. <coughs> bailing up pigs for one of the guys in our Great Australian Pig Hunt promotion. Yeah, yeah, but... but um, That's a yard. That's great. <laughs> yeah, they're not as not as crazy as those. Um, <laughs> now, 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 and you can uh, you can call them back, and there's yeah, you know, they don't try and grab them. So, right. But it's just uh, so it's a dog this big, but like little mm -hmm. sort of thing. A, a little girl might have in a pocket of her jacket, um, <clears throat> and it'll bail up pigs and mobs of pigs and things like that. So, if a dog shows a predisposition for pigs, we're not snobs about it. We'll just we'll just go right, good, whack it. Let's get it out there. Let's see what it does. Because the objective is to uh, is is to hunt, we, and that'll bring me to something about the uh, forming groups of pig hunters, you know. But the objective is to hunt and to be successful, um, and it doesn't really matter what the dog looks like or anything like that. Everyone's always looking for um, what we'd call old lines, you know, like proven lines that consistently produce dogs that will uh, will hunt hard. But see the see even around Inverell, in where I go, uh, around here, rises up to um, not high by US standards, but high for around here. Yeah. Um, steep, lots of blackberry, um, uh, more rain, and all that sort of stuff than the western side. The western side of where we'd go is just flat as a tack, and <laughs> different and hotter. Um, yeah. Different, and so some dogs do better where they've got to climb a mountain and grab something there and then tumble down, uh, yeah. or if they've got to run something down at pace. So it's it can be a bit like putting together a, a football team of whatever code. Different people have different jobs, but the American experience with sport and other things is to tend to have more specialists, and we have more all rounders in what we yeah. do. Um, so in our football codes, the smallest guy on the field might have to knock over the biggest guy on the other team, and if he has to, he has to. That's it. Right. There is there right. isn't a well, gee whiz, he's only a little guy. It's just has he got enough guts, and that's yeah. what happens with the pig dogs. Is have they got enough drive? Well, I think the interesting thing that you said was, you know, you're not snobs. You're just out there looking for dogs that can get the job done. Yeah. Uh, over here in the states, we can we can be kind of snobby about the color of the dog and and being out of this line and and different things i'm no no exception i mean i 
I've, I've got my priest dispositions, things stuck in my mind that I think should work. And a lot of times it hinders me because I'm not open-minded enough. And as I travel around and I hunt with different people, I find that, man, this guy's got a really good pack of dogs, but they don't look like mine. They're not bred like yeah. mine, but this yeah. is a good pack of dogs and you should be happy to be hunting them. It's, it is. Look, it's important to, to keep your eyes open because otherwise we'd all still be uh, living in caves, you know, like we, we, we evolve and we change. Right. So people go back. Uh, my father had an, uh, had a tough upbringing and went through World War II in the Middle East and in the jungle in New Guinea. So he was quite, um, what we'd say here is he'd eaten a few shit sandwiches. And so he still had the taste in his mouth about that. And so you would, um, he would say things, ah, oh, the bloody good old days. Everyone talks about the good old days. Right. The, only thing, right. the only thing good about the bastards is they're gone. And so <laughs> we've, you've got to have that attitude too because people like to glorify the past. And I think it's important to be respectful and to learn the lessons. But there could be some 18-year-old kid who could teach you something new. Uh, or show you a new dog that could change the way you think. A hundred percent. I've said, you know, I, I've been in how, hunting with, with hounds and, and curs and everything for, for 40 years. And what I've come to realize is that I learned something from everybody I hunt with. Yeah. Every single person. You know, I, I remember one time I was hunting with a 13 year old kid who was, grew up in these mountains and and he knew where the bear were so mm -hmm. he knew he'd he'd had already had so much experience and i'm gonna pay attention to that i think a lot of times we get to the point where we think we've arrived and yes. yeah. we yeah. should we should be the people that everybody should be asking advice from and things like that and the most accomplished houndsmen i know dog hunters i know are guys that say I don't know anything. You know, I'm going to keep mm. learning until I die. And you well, look for those opportunities to learn. So you can learn from anything. Um, and I, I'm lucky to have, um, I've got uh, boys who are bushmen. They like to be out in the bush. One of them is a mad fisherman and one of them is a mad pig hunter. Um, and they're both better than me at both things. You know, they're because they're um, they're coming at it from probably a higher base than I did because I had to. I started. I didn't have a pig hunter around me. I just decided I wanted to be a pig hunter, and so I just had to learn by tripping over things. Um, so they might have got a bit of a start in some of those concepts, but they've gone on with it. They've really gone on with it, and and yeah. um, it's it, it, see, I. I, yeah, I don't get my, I, I don't get my ego thing about from. I don't, I don't get my sense of status from um, how long I've been in something. Because um, a, a guy once told me that you know there can be two people who've done something for twenty years, and one person will have twenty years of experience, and one person will have one year of experience repeated twenty times. <laughs> so I love it. So That's people, great. It, it is just yeah, a sobering thing to just go, ooh, which one am I, you know? I got to um, tell you, I got to tell you a good one too. Uh, a, a buddy of mine, we worked together for a number of years. He got a promotion. He became my boss. And uh, I called him and I asked him a question. He's like, well, I don't know. And I said, when are you going to realize that you're the boss now? You're supposed to know this. And he said, when are you going to realize I'm the same dumbass I always was? you know and he's just that that type of humility but i love that one year 20 times deal i tell people all the time it's like i i absolutely think that the old ways of respecting the older generation we have to show that respect but mm. to automatically for a person to for for a per, i mean i'm 55 so I could get into that stage where it's like, well, you're just a young whippersnapper. I've been doing this for so many years. 
all I had to do to get to 55 is just wake up every day. Yeah. That's, all, yeah, that's, that's the only accomplishment I got. Yeah. And it, 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 you, in the same way that you can't see what's in a man's heart or, or how much heart a dog has, you can't see how their brain works. So some people, are, when they're saying, oh, pigs do this or dogs do that, they're talking about their experience in a particular valley over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily translate out to another circumstance. And what I like to do, what fascinates me, is learning, well, what happens in that country over there? Well, or, yeah. um, you know, I, I, get, I get too much... Um, I get too much consideration because of my age and a perception that I might know things. I get too much respect for that, and I I feel like that's undeserved. What if um, I think I, I have to I have to continue to show you know, yeah. what I can do and things like that. So that was part of the ego thing for me in changing from wholly hard finding dogs because that's what you do, and that was the culture I grew up in to having a mixture of bailing dogs and um, and hard dogs. I can tell you what, the vet bills just plummeted as soon as I got bailing dogs, just absolutely crashed. I, I'm just, they don't even recognise me now as the vet and uh, I used to have a chair with my name on it. It was just incredible <laughs> you know? um, yeah. because, you know, you're getting there faster um, right. and the dog's in contact with the pig for less time. Um, so... You know, we're, we're focused on that when we're talking to government about access or trialling this or trying that, you know, because we have our haters here, you know. We're, um, we're a very, despite all the movies and the perceptions, we're a very urbanised um, community, Australia. Most people are living, you know, in a tiny amount of space in Australia or just clinging to the edge. Um, and it's like the first place really? that, that Australians land. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you should is most of, is most of the the land in Australia considered like crown land, or how does that? No, no, vast amounts of private land, um, some Aboriginal land. Um, okay, like all land here is owned by someone, so it's either mm -hmm. owned by the government, or it's owned by private landholders, or it's so um, that's our constant battle here is access. How do we get good access? So we, as individuals and as a team um, representing pig hunters, we work hard on our relationship with um, private landholders because they're our bread and butter. And we're yeah. very lucky in that they like um, sometimes young pig hunters will say, oh, cockies, that's what we call it, like cocky is a landholder and it comes from, um, from the word cockatoo, which is a bird here. Right. And they tend, yeah. cockatoos tend to appear and perch up high and watch what's going on. Um, and so cockatoo, the word cocky as a, a descriptor of a, uh, a landholder goes back to um, there would be large, like massive swathes of land either granted to someone who was well-connected or taken up by someone who rode into it on a horse and then said, that's mine. And, right. you know, and then defended it with a gun, um, same as white settlement everywhere. Um, then the government would come in and say, right, that's not viable. We need more farmers out there and we need to populate the area. So they would compulsorily acquire some of those things and break them up. Before they did that, sometimes a cocky might appear, a, a person might fly in and perch on a block of land and just go, well, I'm just going to sit here and see what happens. And so that's where the, the term comes from. So we work with cockies as much as possible um, at a um, sort of a committee and a legislative level uh, if we can uh, and certainly on individual levels. So I had a young guy once, well, I have several young guys saying, oh, the cockies, oh, cockies hate pig hunters. And I said, they don't hate pig hunters. They love pig hunters. They hate idiots. They just can't tell the difference. <laughs> so you've got to separate yourself from the idiots. Yeah. Um, I think this is a good place to jump into the to what you're doing there. Um, yep, and talk about what's the name of your organisation? Um, it's a long formal sort of name. It's the Australian Pig Doggers and Hunters Association, uh, mm -hmm. the APDHA. Um, 
It's been going for 20 years. I haven't been active in it for 20 years. I was around for some early discussions about it, went and did my own thing, and I came back in. We do have um, a committee member who was there at the first meeting to form it, um, and his 20th anniversary comes up next year. So we're in our 20th year now, um, and it's a national body. Uh, so it was just created out of a perceived need, pardon me, that came from the, the first forum, the old internet forums, that was set up in Australia uh, called Boar Dogs uh, by a friend of mine, Ian Colley. He set up this forum and pig hunters just flocked to it and we realised, yeah, there's a lot of pig hunters. And then some of the discussions there, a few people realised, okay, we've got to get organised because there's some widely divergent attitudes here, some of which are going to damage us um, and some aren't. Some could take us forward. So we need to have a voice. So the, the pioneers of this got together, interestingly, uh, on a property on a town we have near here called Texas. So there's, there's Texas, you, Quinta, you know. Um, anyway, so they had a, a camp there, a few drinks, bonfire, um, looking at one another's dogs and formed a committee. So I'm, I'm now the head of that committee. So I'm, I'm what's called the national president, and we do that for, in three-year stints. This is my second stint. Um, and we have matured to a point where it, it's an elliptical curve, that you, and you'll find this. Your thing will, 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 will get going. Um, the Houndsman Alliance will get going, and there'll be lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of work to do to gain, you know, 10 yards, lots and lots of work. But when you gain yeah. 10 yards, you know, the next amount of work might, might double that, and the next amount of work might double that. And so you start to gain once you've got your your, your structure and your concepts and things clear um, and everyone's singing from the same hymn book, so they're all going forward in the same yeah. direction. Now, yeah. you never get everyone involved, but if you do that, so where, in, if you do that, eventually it's, um, you know, it, it is an elliptical curve. We're at, the, at a point where we're doubling to quite a, a, a uh, in terms of um, capacity and achievements um, at an well, astonishing level. Some questions I have right off the bat for you, Ned. Um, yep. What? is your ratio of the number of hunters that you have out there compared to the number of hunters that are members of your organization? Oh, uh, look, maybe 5% are members. The rest aren't. We why, might have why, do you th why do you think that is? Why, why are you not capturing 95%? What's the, what do you think, think people's reason is for that? Well, it, well, for not joining. The way we look at it is it's, that's, it's down to us, not them. We, we haven't sold the message well enough. I think the nature of pig hunters is to be individuals. Um, see, none of us would be involved in a club. None of us on the committee would be involved in any club about pig hunting. We'd just go pig hunting if we didn't feel there was an imminent threat to the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So we feel there's an imminent threat and uh, we feel, well, our, our driving thing is if we don't do something, then something's going to be done to us. Stuff's getting done, um, and right. it's either two or four buyers. So some of that's age. The, like the bell curve on pig hunters is about 18 to 32, and they certainly weren't my smartest years as a man. Lots of activity, <laughs> but not a lot of thinking. And, um, and pig hunters, as a rule, just want to hunt. They just want to hunt. They don't want to be involved in committees and things like that. So we then... Um, so we have to show our relevance, but that's what I mean is we've hit hit a point this year where we're picking up members every day, every literally every day our membership rises because we've 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 gone to every you know like we, we'll attend the opening of an envelope we, we will we will go to anything that might touch on on pig hunting and try and give our guys a voice. Um, and what th that has achieved is we're known to exist. Mm -hmm. We're known to be able to contribute um, something useful to the conversation, and sometimes we change things. So when that starts to happen 
um, you're dealing with people further and further up the food chain and better and better educated. So you have you, to. I want to dig on. into that a little bit. You know, it's it's so what you're saying is, is as you get you you get out there and you get more exposure, then you get more influence with the policymakers is who you're talking about, right? Sure. You talk well and policy influence it too. Like it's yeah. you know, a professor mightn't make the policy, but their decision or their comments might affect the policy maker. Yes. Yes. So and and is there if you say you're picking up members every day, has there been something that's happened in Australia that's kind of ignited that energy and that interest to be involved? Yes. Um so there is always a threat, but that's not perceived as a threat all the time by pig hunters. However, what we've found from mixing with smarter people, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You've got to get in with people who oh, are smarter. Like than you. You've, got, you, you've got to be with smarter people and you've got to be capable of going, ooh, they're smart. Now, what's that word mean? And, and so, so at meetings, I'll just go, look, I'm sorry, what does that word mean? And they'll explain it to you. Um, you're better to ask and then you're on the same level and pretend and just not know yeah. because you'll miss opportunities. But so we we spent, the, the history of it is this, we spent four years on um, committees in Queensland, which is a big state full of pigs and crocodiles and good fishing and and uh, <laughs> and wonderful people just north of it. I'm two hours from Queensland where I live. Um, and we spent... But because they're the northern part of Australia, they're approaching the equator. And so that's near New Guinea and East Timor uh, and Indonesia. There is a fear of incursion of exotic animal diseases from Southeast Asia and from New Guinea. Um, and there's a significant uh, domestic pig industry for us in Queensland. So we one of the, one of the great things that happened to us was we were recognised as relevant in that discussion and invited mm -hmm. onto a committee to say, how how can hunters influence our decision-making on this? So we grabbed that with both hands. And uh, Mark Beatty, who's our Queensland president and the guy that's been doing, working with this for 20 years, I can't believe it, we've been invited to a meeting because we usually just push our way in, you know. Right, some right. Physical. So we got invited. We've got, people here, we've got people here that are doing the same thing. You look at, Wisconsin bear hunters, for instance, you know, it, they don't have to push their way in the room anymore. They're invited into yep. the room. Utah so Houndsman, Corey Huntsman, you know, he's made it his himself and, and those guys out in Utah have made themselves available for biologists to study mountain lions and yes. bears and things like that. So they've done so, the right things and made themselves available. And now they don't have to push their way into the room. They're being invited. What do you think? How do you feel? What do you think? Do you think this will work? What are the implications of that? That's what you yes. ask, or how can you contribute? So we learned from that experience. Mark went to those meetings, um, and they it, that developed a um, like a plan for if African swine fever because we're we're a really clean country because we're an island. So you know we we don't have foot and mouth. We don't have African swine fever. We don't have rabies. Yeah. There's all sorts of stuff we don't have. Um, so and you don't want it. That, we don't want it, and that's why we get a premium for our produce and things. So that's part of our role with the, the uh, private landholders and the rural community. So anyway, from that, he just came out of it and he said, data, we've got to have data. Every bus has got data and we've got none. So this year we created a data-gathering exercise and that's what's been the catalyst for everything in terms of... What is of, it? Uh, what's it called? Well, it's called... It's a, it's a data gathering exercise, but we framed it as a competition and it's called the uh -huh. Great Australian Pig Hunt. And so um, <laughs> people, the, so it's structured like this, people register. Well, first of all, in about three days, because we just had an idea just before, like just after Christmas it was, we said, oh, we've got to do something. How are we going to get data? And just bang, we just came up with this idea. It was a bit of a, you know, lightning moment. Um that's the thing about get, getting bald too. You, you start attracting lightning. So anyway, lightning hit us, and we created this thing called the Great Australian Pig Hunt. Yeah, well, so you're you'll be imminently struck. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm right there with you, Ned. Yeah, bald as a um, cue ball. 
so the 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 great australian pig hunt was was created within about three days we'd attracted uh, about 40 grand in support from corporate partners and these were people that we'd been friendly with but we'd never asked for help you know yeah but they were the, the pretty girl sitting in the corner but we we're too scared to ask them to dance so because we thought <laughs> oh, what if they reject us we just went right well, we can't afford to be rejected so we, we went to them and they jumped at it and they said right well we'll so what we ended up with was um a thousand dollar prize every month about a $600 second prize and about a $250 to $300 third prize every month, and that was a lucky draw. So people would register. I'm going to be in the, the Great Australian Pig Hunt. Here's my details. Then, And they do this online. Then online they submit a return on how many pigs they're getting and a photo or two or four, whatever they want. So we end up then with a participation rate. So it might be yeah. 20% of people who identify as pig hunters actually hunt in that month. Um, then we get how many pigs are caught by those people. So we already have figures from previous studies. This started a couple of years ago. We did our own study and had it checked by smart people, and they said, yep, cool, um, where we worked out how many pig hunters there were. So we could then, we can go, right, well, 20% of pig hunters are hunting in January. What's 20% of 125,000? That's how many pig hunters are hunting around Australia. And we, again, we, we got a, yeah. Yeah, with that, we got a, advice on that. I said, yes, you can infer things from, from existing research that if that's that, therefore this can be inferred. Um, and we say it like that. These aren't guaranteed figures, but we end up with a figure. How many pigs the people catch, we divide by the number of hunters who submitted things and we get a, uh, a yield. So it, that hovers around 17 to 18, maybe 19 pigs a month per hunter who's active. So then you apply that to the percentage of the 125,000 and that's your figure yeah. for how many pigs have been killed. So a couple of things happen. Um, we The big prizes, oh, then at the end of the year there's a motorbike, a rifle, uh, really good thermal setup with super-duper spotlight that that's just a last final draw. So there's no prizes for big pigs, number of pigs, anything like that. So it's uh, it's not a, uh, uh, you know, a, I'm trying to think of what a way it's not called. Anyway, it's not about showing how big you are and how fantastic you are. It's just right. you get drawn out of a hat. So one person could put in one entry for one little sucker and win a motorbike. <laughs> you know, that's it's just random. Yeah. Um, but we started to get figures. The best prizes go to our members, and we're just unashamed about that. Like the top prizes, the big value prizes, you got to be a, a financial member. You can't yeah. be out by a day. You have to be a financial member. Right. We coupled that then with starting to ring the expired members. G'day, what are you doing? Why aren't you? Why, well, oh, yeah, my, my cat's sick, and I had to go to the vet. Right out. Do you want to keep going, or do you need help? Can we work out a plan for you? And, oh, yeah, no, we want to keep going. Just you know, forgot about it, man. And you know, so right, we, we we chase our members, but we had more. The organic growth has been from this um, competition. So every month, we write up a report on the findings of those figures, and we we took advice from a uh, a, a professor. We've got our own professor, um, and uh, he oversees what we're doing and just says, "Yeah, that makes sense. Good. That'll stand scrutiny. Yep, good." Um, and, and we found out, interestingly, this professor, because he was just a name we were given, we were introduced to him by uh, one of the people from the African swine fever meetings. I know someone who can help you because we'd established ourselves as reasonable people. He, it turns out he's a rock star in this world. We didn't know who he was, but everyone else does. As soon as we, um, as soon as we mention his name, it's like saying, oh, yeah, no, my brother, he's the debt collector for the uh, rebels. You know, people treat you differently. So yeah. he's he's the um, he's a big noise, um, smart, young, good looking. Everyone wants to be his friend, and and he's interested in wildlife research. So he started giving us some other ideas, and so we've launched other things. But what what we've the, the biggest thing is this pig hunt. So every month we've got data. This is how many pigs are being 
caught and killed by recreational hunters and we do it state by state. Um, this is the value of that because we have other research on how much pig hunters spend. So we can say at the moment we're on track for the end of this year um, to announce that pig hunters in Australia spend a million dollars a day on pig hunting. No kidding. Each day. Each day. Wow. That's, that's the spend. Now, that gets the attention of government um, and that they're killing, um, like we're up, we're over, oh, I'm just about to write the, ne- the, the, the last report, but we're, we're at about three and a half million pigs in Australia for the year so far. No? So wow. In a, in, a, in a place like New South Wales, uh, we're killing 38,000 pigs a week. In Queensland, it's 36,000 pigs a week. Now, that makes big news. And then, of course, you've got further brand awareness. You've got members who are feeling proud to be associated with these things. Um, We have politicians and decision makers asking for that information. Um, And so suddenly we're we're, we're in that elliptical curve. We're on the really on the up curve now because sure. uh, we uh, we are delivering data. You've got to find the language. You know, the the easy way to be dehumanised is for there to be no communication. So you've got to find, and and the start of that is as you said, you've got um, guys over there who are assisting biologists. They're all allies. Those people now they know what we'd call the higher education people, the professors and the researchers, they know the value of hunters already because you can put your hands on animals. They need the animals to do their studies and hunters will do it for nothing. If they have to do it themselves, they've got to have a team of chorus girls and a person in charge of hats and they've got to have a whole like vast number of people, whereas yeah. a hunter will just go, out and go, how many do you want? Well, you want six pigs? Bang, I've got six pigs. You know, right. they can do all their sampling. You know, so that's what's happened. That the the mood is it, a social, is it a social issue that's widely accepted over there, Ned, with your with your wild your wild feral pigs? I mean, what is it what a do problem? You mean, well, is it a problem that your wildlife managers and things are trying to resolve? And oh and yeah, you guys yeah, are yeah, filling yeah. a niche. Well, yeah. What kind of well, what's the pushback you get from the the animal rights crowd and do you well, get any of that? You know, they're, it's like the Christian Muslim thing. There's, they, there will be some people who will look for common ground. So an environmentalist can see our, the role that we play. Um, an animal rights person can't see anything but their own religion. And their religion right. is that all animals are fur babies and must be cuddled and so on. But the, they don't understand the concept of biological fulfillment and where the devil to them. So uh, how much how much effort do you spend on trying to I'm I'm just gonna say it, how much effort do you spend on trying to convince them that you're right? Zero. Zero on the animal rights movement. Um, Thank you. Because you just you can't. They, they have a there's a reasonable expectation in society that we consider um, the welfare of the dogs and the animals we're hunting. Quick kills, don't stand around watching a dog chew on a pig. You know, that's just, right. you know, don't film that, don't do all those things. Um, and, you know, so we have a position on that. But the animal rights people, see, animal, even animal rights and animal welfare are two different things. Animal rights people are saying animals are humans and they're mm-hmm. not. We eat the animals. Um, so the... Uh, Animal welfare people, you can talk to them about welfare. They mightn't agree with with our position on things, but you can talk to an animal welfare person. So the animal welfare people, they are concerned about different things, and we address those. We talk to them about that, and we say, well, this is how we've managed that. We're open to, to pig hunters to hunt legally, having to do so, an animal welfare education component. You know, we're happy with that. You know, like, okay, this is what good animal welfare would look like. And the professor I was talking about before, he, I was at a conference, we go to every conference too, and, and sometimes we get on stage. We've been on stage at two, one national and one international conference, which is just a breakthrough for wolfhead pig hunters, you know, sure. and talking about, about what we're doing in the midst of 
all of you know some people hate us at those things you know but you've got to you've got to have the guts to just get up there and go i might be the most hated person in the room but i've been given a chance to talk now for a few minutes i'm going to talk and then you wait for the attacks that come with the questions and try and not lose your temper i'm short-tempered so that's not a great thing um <laughs> but i'm trying to be a mature adult but the um the, the professor that I talked about, he was at this, the Australasian, that's Australia and New Zealand, uh, vertebrate pest conference. It was the 19th one of them, uh, and it was uh, on in Sydney just recently. He actually gave a talk there about uh, ethics and welfare, and he said that killing animals um, can ethically be, can be allowed ethically under a whole lot of range. He said the base position is if humans are going to live on Earth, we're going to kill animals one way or the other. The only question that's really up for debate is how do we kill them and how long does it take and how much does it hurt? So that's right. the welfare dis discussion. So that's where we focus. We focus on the welfare discussion uh, and we go on the, on the basis that, look, I, I've had contracts, you know, as a pig controller uh, with a hippie commune because the pigs were, were ripping up their veggies and they had no qualms because they were trying to live, you know, in harmony right. and grow the veggies and things like that. They didn't want to kill the animals. They were comfortable for me to do it. It was walking through swamps with snakes. That is the thing we've got here is some bad snakes. Um, you know, you're going in there and getting pigs in, in – it, it was sort of like Louisiana stuff, you know, uh -huh. down on the coast. And, um, they were comfortable with that because they also wanted the pigs out for the environmental uh, benefits. So, yeah. it, it, like – one of the things we learned from that is the opponents are fractured, so they they haven't got a spear point. They will come up with things every now and then. We're expecting a significant pushback after this year or during this year because it's just gone too well. We're just going, right, they're yeah. amassing something or they've got photos of someone in their underwear or something will ha happen, you know. <laughs> so we're yeah. just – you're just on the balls of your feet all the time and now we've got data. We can – you know, I can say it's a million dollars a week in money. Where, where does that money go, you know? into bloody, you know, into meth, into this, into that, or you want people out actively working and doing stuff and, you know, whatever. Sure. So um, all of these things, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, and eventually that starts to generate its own heat and create its own things. So um, so if we, we have an AGM, an annual general meeting. We're required to, by the law under which we're constituted, um, because we get certain um, benefits um, and things and limit our liability if everything goes south. So part of that is you've got to have an AGM. So we contacted one of our best friends in the corporate world and they've donated their, they've got a, a business, um, you know, outdoor business, pig dogs, you know, guns, camping mm -hmm. gear, barbecuing gear. An American would feel perfectly at home in this shop. They've got an indoor shooting range. Um, they've got a big meeting room and all this sort of thing and a great big car park. And yeah. I got on and I'd, I'd camped with the guy who owns it and we'd had, um, you know, a few drinks around the, around the campfire and got to know one another and both liked one another after we'd been drinking for some time um, <laughs> around the campfire and speaking plainly. So we've remained friends. Anyway, I called him. I said, I want to do an AGM. We want to have it at your place. And he said, yeah, bring it on. What do you need? I said, oh, well, we can just, if we can use that room, that'll be great. Well, he's since organised just bells and whistles and all sorts of things and demonstrations of this and he's working on, you know, getting taxidermy displays and all this sort of stuff. So it becomes a little mini festival for a day. So um, that's an end. And we're buying a buggy that we're going to uh, raffle for people to raise money um, for some of our research projects and things like that. So we're getting, we're thinking bigger, we're putting on bigger events. If you can get, you know, families and children coming along, um, you can, your members feel like they're getting something for their money and other people are going, oh, these people seem to be, you know, quite effective right. and quite useful. So um, we're, and that then launches our plans for the 20th year celebrations. So we've got a guided hunt we want to give away to a member in our 20th year or in the 20, in the anniversary year. Um, and what's happened is 
we've become a bit prouder and a bit more confident of what we've got. One of our committee members, when we started, said, but what have we got to sell? Like, what can we say? And so we had to sort of go, oh, well, we're this and we're that and we can help with this. But say on, like now on Facebook, we've got nearly 22,000 followers. Now, that's mm -hmm. not big in the world, but it's fairly big here and that's about sure. 22% of our market. Yeah. So we've got a conduit there, you see, to to build that. Um, and it, when we get big news in a, in, in a, a reputable paper, um, a newspaper, there's still newspapers here, um, when we get good news stories in there, oh, pig hunters are doing this and that's fantastic, says, you know, Bill Bloggs, the landholders, bloody chairman of this area or something like that. So we've got state agricultural papers that are running stories about shit, that's a lot of pigs, that's pretty good, right. you know, right. and then that that generates interest, so, that gives us something to put on Facebook, that builds more you know, uh, more potential members. What I'm hearing is um, you, guys have, you guys have put together an organization that's got a lot of different levels to it, layers, I should say. Yes. Um, you're using all the resources you can find, you're using innovation, you know, you're not just thinking, you're you're trying to bust out of your own little echo chambers. We're real good as houndsmen, as hunters, to talk to other hunters, to talk to guys that are like-minded. And we need to find ways. You you have found ways to break outside of that and talk to, you know, like your ag papers and make friends there and get yeah. good good press there. And then you take that press and you put it on your own and you market it for your own cause. Yes. You've you've reached out to professors. You've done all done all this stuff, and and it sounds like you've got a good recipe there. We we think we do, um, but we only know what we know. We don't know what we don't know. So we're yeah. just wide open um, to like like my my deputy Mark um, and I. We talk every day at about seven o'clock in the morning. It's mm -hmm. our first phone call while we're heading for work. He lives oh, six hours away from me, seven hours away. Uh, we talk every morning about where's the membership numbers, what are they today, um, what's happening with the, with Facebook, what's going on there, um, uh, what's our plan for the day. And it's not a formal thing. It's just we're trying to motivate one another, you know, right? because we can feel this is moving and we don't want to go, oh, great, it's moving, let's enjoy the movement. We're just going, no, keep pushing, push, 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 push. Right. And, it, it, and things just are coming at us. Like if, if you've got a successful sports team, people want to join that club or want to go and watch those games. Right. If you've got a losing sports team, same people, the people don't go to the games. So we're trying to be a winning team and people want to wear your clothes if you're a winning team. Like how many Jordan shoes did people buy? Exactly. Didn't, didn't make them any better at anything. You're paying just, somebody else to wear their brand yes. and advertise. You're, you're, most athletes and celebrities need to be paid in order to represent a brand. And yes. certain people like the Jordan shoes, Nike has figured out how to get people excited and advertise their brand for them. Yeah, and it's people who want to be involved with that and associated with that level of success. So pig hunters here, um, as a rule, felt disrespected and ignored and worse under attack. So what we are attempting to do is to turn that around and get them respected and recognised and um, ready and willing if someone wants to attack us. We're, we're, we're tooled up. You know, that's what that's what we're up against here, Ned. We have, uh, as a community of, of hunters, whether it's lion hunters, bear hunters, hog hunters, whatever it is, you know, we've, we've tried to fly under the radar and avoid, uh, you know, being noticed and things, and it's cost us. And it, it goes yeah. back to that theory that if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu type thing. And if if you don't control your own narrative, somebody else is going to control it for yeah. you. Well, a, th a thing to so think about is that, that most hunters aren't interested in politics. Not at all. Politics is, but politics We just want to be left alone. 
We just want to be left uh, alone and do our own thing. Correct. Most hunters aren't interested in politics, but politics is interested in hunters. So you have to have a, you have to be involved because otherwise non-hunters will make decisions for you and then you'll all cry into your, into your hands and go, oh, no, how could that be done? It's um, in, our, in our family, the Makem family, the, the rule is if, if you are capable, do. It's not up to anyone yeah. else. If, if you can lift that, lift the bloody thing. If you can, you know, so I feel I have something to contribute here. I'm, I am morally bound to do this, then that's a strong driver. Uh, right. I have grandchildren. I would like them to have that op opportunity. Hunters everywhere just want to hunt. But yes. part of the payback for that sense of freedom and that, uh, that tremendous joy and satisfaction you get is to go, who gets to hunt next? You know, it, it, can my kids hunt? Can my, you know, can my grandkids hunt? What, what, how will they look at us? Like imagine, you know, you could, you could hear the comments of someone saying, oh, they used to be able to hunt bear here. And then all those guys just, you know, wouldn't get organised, didn't meet any of the contacts. They just hunted bears until they were too old and then they uh, dead and we're just left with nothing. Like, That's right. Like, your country has a, has a rich history, so does ours, in service and duty and people getting out of their comfort zone to fight for what they thought was right. Like, yeah. surely this is a very small fight to, compared to crawling through the bloody jungle in New Guinea. Right. <laughs> this is nothing. You know, so that's the, the mentality we've got to get. Our history, and I'll editorialize here a little bit if you'll, if you'll allow me to, to, to kind of drive this point home for our listeners here in the United States. You know, our, our legacy goes back to colonial days, but the but the North American model was founded around 130 years ago, and it came on the backs of a lot of hard work. It came on the backs of, of hunters stepping up and saying, this is our wildlife, it's important enough to us, that we're going to pay for it. And it's like every generation we've got away from that. We've The last 40 years we've enjoyed wildlife populations that would would rival pre-settlement days you know in the in the united states because of the hard work from the people that came before us and now it's our time to step up and say you're not taking this from us that's ours it's on our watch and and there's got to be a, a fight for the legacy that that hunters have paid for and that's what we're trying to get ignited here and it's it's there it's just it's been disjointed it's been unorganized we've got pockets of great success in different places and then we've got other places that are susceptible to attack and and the the anti-hunting community has capitalized on our disorganization the fact that we're disjointed the fact that we fight among each other um uh, and, and we have not learned how to play the bigger game of influence and finding that corporate sponsorship, finding that influence with policymakers, with our, our elected representatives, with a local university professor, all those things. We haven't done that. And now we're facing a situation where we're going to start paying the piper. We're going to start paying for the fact that we did not want to get involved. Look, it's... It, and I absolutely hear what you're saying, and that can be turned around. Like you, your guys wouldn't be any any more uh, any more difficult cats to try and herd than the pig hunters here in Australia, and that's right. we're cat herders. That's how we see ourselves. Um, but if you can find what works for them, um, and and work. So if someone's got to do the work. But see, you've got different groups representing different types of hound hunters, let alone all the other hunters that are in the US. Um, yeah. So they're going to quite naturally look after themselves. Some of them will be big thinkers. Some of them will be narrow thinkers. But the if it was me, I'd be initially talking to the people who are running all those different groups and saying, what would you want out of a, um, a body 
that could could represent you all in one fell swoop, a foundation or a something, you know. Um, yeah. And and because some of them will be, some of them will already have a blueprint that works, you know, and that'll mm -hmm. be down to one person who's driven that, you know. So, right. um, the, you know, so that can just get down to an, an MOU, a, a memorandum of understanding, you know, that say, um, yeah, we think hunting's a legitimate thing to do. Uh, we think it's a um, a positive economic driver. We think it's a positive uh, wildlife management tool. Um, and we just like to do it anyway, whatever. And you just have, yeah. like, say, four things that you can all agree to. And then suddenly you're one unit and you can present as one unit. And it's not about money and it's not about this and that yet, but you can just go, right, we're one unit. We all agree with these things. So what you'll strike is that people will go, oh, yeah, but this is a trick, you know, because America is the <laughs> home of the conspiracy theory. Yeah. It's a trick. They're trying to do this. They're going to take it over and then he's going to wear a big hat. And I want oh, yeah. to wear a big hat, you know. You'll get a bit of that. Um, so you can't react to that. you just got to understand that's that – hunter organisations are trauma victims. They feel like they've been attacked and they've been besieged, you know. Um, yeah. And so they'll react like that. They'll, they'll – um, I'm starting to wave my hands about. I'm getting psyched up. Um, I, I talk will, with my hands too. Yeah, yeah. I get they, wound up. So they will um, they will be suspicious of you or your goals or the, the Houndsman Alliance goals. Like as soon as I saw that come up, I thought, right, we're going to get in on this. We're going to, you know, throw some ideas their way because we feel like it's working here. We feel like we've found a formula. Um, you know, and, and we've already said, right, should we go over there? Like, if we get invited, will we go? Yes, we'll go, you know. Like, if we feel so strongly about it because then that we're here, then you're a much bigger, you know, potential body. We'd love to be friends with a, you know, a great big friend, you know. There, there's Then you've got two people, who, two groups that can bounce off one another. Um, right. You know, there can be people... Like Beretta is one of our uh, great supporters. You know, Beretta, the firearms. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. Sure. Beretta's going to be in the US. You just never know. You know, like there might right. be some commonality there. That There might be some things that we've got. Um, you know, we, we get, we're giving away Yeti stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, Garmin stuff. Like, mm -hmm. So we, we're getting some support there anyway. So there is a thing to expand on that. Um, that already exists, you know, like, um, but the key thing is always going to be, we still have, we still have pig hunters who think, one guy said, think we're idiots. One bloke sent me a message and uh, uh, told me to stop being a masturbator and stop running a, a, a jerk circle, you know, for our own benefit. And, our, our own. and we're just, what are you talking about? You know, like, so if this takes me 30 hours a week voluntary time, and uh, I still have to go out to work um, because I spent too much money when I was young. So my <laughs> uh, my second in charge, Mark, he's doing 30 hours a week voluntary time and he definitely has to work. He's a builder. Um, so there's 60 hours volunteer work every week from two people and that's um, – that plus a good idea and then support from the rest of our committee and different things or um, even if it's picking up a mistake we've made, yeah. you, you know, it's right well, because we want to have everything clean going out. But they come up with good ideas or they'll contact a sponsor or something like that. There's all sorts of stuff they're doing. But I, we know that we've done that we do the 30 hours because we clocked it. Because that was actually yeah. with my partner, Jenny, said you should be clocking this because that's a figure that you need to, your members need to know. We're right yeah. So we did. But that's that level of activity is required to develop the momentum that eventually requires less effort to maintain. But you're trying to move mm. a big, heavy railway carriage with two people pushing. You know, so you start once you get it going, you don't stop for a good while you, until it develops a bit of a a bit of movement. Right, the wheels the off off screen. I saw the wheels moving around. That's why I might have been bouncing. Um, the, <laughs> the, um, uh, you have to have people who are willing to do that um, because it, and it, it's largely thankless 
up until it starts to work. People are very generous now in terms of their their praise of the APDHA and their comments and their, you know, th- you know I've sent the private messages, thanks, mate, we really appreciate what you're doing. And it helps that you're giving out a few prizes. Now, another little thing is um, when people send in their photos for this competition, we prioritise stereotype busters. So the the stereotype here is all white, male, young, probably drunk, um, and buffing mm-hmm. dogs. Yeah. Uh, that's the, you know, that's what our haters think. So if you go through our Facebook page, and I'd encourage any of your listeners to, to look us up and have a look, uh, it'll make our numbers look good too. But look... Look at the photos because um, photo, pig hunters want to send in a photo of a big boar and that's one of the criticisms. Oh, pig hunters are only interested in big boars and our counter right. to that is, well, we're, we're collecting the, the, the gender of the pigs and it's 50-50 whether they catch big boars or sows. They just prefer the photos of the big boars. Yeah. They'll catch a big boar first and go, yay, but they'll catch any pig available, you know, because here it's about killing them all, you know, that's right. the objective. Um, so... The photos will have women and children, uh, family groups, people of uh, all available nationalities, you know, that, that hunt. Um, then we've started to do an in their, in their own words section. We've got a couple of, um, couple of members, both female, both in the medical field. One is, um, I guess, what you'd call a causeman, um, like a medic in the army, mm-hmm. right. she hunts with dogs, and the other lady is a um, like um, shit fight nurse. So that's a like into the emergency room. Right, where's the where's that piece? Where's that piece? Get them here. She's that, and she's from um, uh, she's from Asia, and she's taken it up here as a bow hunter. So we get those people to write their own story. Why are they interested in hunting? And right. we've targeted them particularly because we're uh, look, our our, um, our membership figures too, we go through those. 33% of our membership is families. So that changes that stereotype too. So anything that you can, that, that all arms us with information. And then say so in our strategic plan, hang on, I'm reaching over here. So this is the draft strategic plan. Looks like a, you know, bag of rubbish. Um but it includes all sorts of, oh, yes, this is what we're going to do. But then we've just got pages like that that have got yeah. uh, a million dollars a day. That's, you mm-hmm. know, that's what hunters are spending and, you know, and then the attribution. Um, because sooner or later we'll adopt that at this or a version of it um, at this year's AGM. Um, and uh, But the government here loves, so look at these, look at these, Pig hunters here. Now that's not your, your, your standard stereotype. Oh yeah, a couple of young girls in, in the cotton. Um, right. So we do that with permission, um, but we we're trying to to show that pig hunters aren't what people think, and pig hunting isn't what people think. Right. Because even in the hunting world here, um, in the bad old days, we were just seen as the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. You know, we, we were the lowest. Right. What has happened is because of what we've achieved this year in particular, we're now being asked our opinion by other hunting groups. That's and great. People are reaching out to us. And so it can be the same with in your situation. If you – and see, so we don't bag any other hunting. We say we're for all legal forms of hunting in Australia. Right. So we, we support yeah. all hunters, whatever they're doing. We don't care if they're, you know – Doing whatever, um, catching ducks, ducks out of the air. If that's legal, do that. Um, yep. And we're, we're we're comfortable with regulation of hunting uh, because that regulate. As soon as you get hunting regulated, it generates figures, and then you've got governments going, oh, fifty million dollars, right? We'll right. have some of that, you know. Um, the the old thing of hiding, they're, they're coming for you anyway, you know. <laughs> Like we like to hunt pigs, animal rights people like to hunt us. So they're coming. Right. You've got to be yep. ready. For sure. 
for sure. Neb, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to figure out a way to communicate a little more easily um, mm-hmm. and more often because I like what you're doing. Everything from down to the the way you're branding. I mean, you're not you're thinking outside the box. You're trying to you're trying to uh, accomplish something here using strategies that have been used against us you know, a bit more of a business model. And it's time that that houndsmen everywhere realize the power of, like you said, hunting regulations. When hunting's regulated, it produces money. And when money is produced for the government, then politicians want to be able to use that money and they'll mm-hmm. fight for you because they, they don't want to try to figure it. They can't come out in their next campaign and say, we're going to raise your taxes because we, we're losing all that. That's the most unpopular thing they can say. You know what so, happens? When you, when you get those figures, departments are formed around them. So you'll have the department of. Um, so in our primary industries, which is farming department in New South Wales, there is a subsection that's for yep. hunting. And there's a subsection that's for fishing. So there are people working in that department for hunting. Um, so they become people who are, looking for data and information and things like that. You've got a I've got a, an arm of government in our state now that's going, right, our hunting, what does that achieve? Oh, it's got this and that and what numbers. And so there's a we get to talk direct to senior public servants about what we're doing. Right. And we never come in demanding anything. We just come in with information. I think it boils but, down to this. None of us like government. You know, in the in the hunting community, I think it's probably the same there. Uh, mm. I assume it is. You know, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. none of it, yeah. none of us like government, but we've got to face reality that government's not going anywhere. So we've got to figure out how we take the power of government and use it in our favor. And that's that. There are a few people here in the states that have figured that out but it's got to be more of a widespread message. We've got to train everybody in every state how to how to find that way to manipulate those politicians for our cause. Yeah, well, and could I suggest that the most important thing, first of all, is to get find the common ground, even if it's only two or three points between your hunting organisations and just invite people to join the, the hunting alliance. You, I see you've got a steering committee. Um, yeah. I'll, read, I'll read your stuff. Um, <laughs> because we seriously want to help. You know, it's, it's a, yeah. we're on a mission here, you know. Right. And, uh, Blues Brothers style. Um, and, <laughs> where, um, and, and so, so you've got a really good base, you know. So the next thing I would suggest is, you know, communicate with your, with your, other hunting organisations saying, this is what we're thinking about, this is what we'd like to achieve, and 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 we are absolutely up for helping you with this, absolutely. Man, so we will we find a way that we communicate yeah. and we'll share any any information, any style, any um, platforms we've got. We'll share what we've got. We don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not precious about that. Um, we've already reached out um, to some of our some of our organisations here, just, just as... I guess you could call it a courtesy call because yes. anytime, anytime an organization pops up like this, then automatically, if you don't take that time and, and we've had the opportunity to build some really good relationships over the years with this podcast. So I already know the, a lot of the leadership in these organizations. So I just reached out to him and said, Hey, I know what it's like. Another organization popping up. There's a limited pool of money out there. We get it. We're not here to compete with you. We're here to accomplish a goal and represent our base mm. and work with you and collaborate with you and be there for you as much as we need you to be there for us. I think it's you're, you're, I, we have to do that. You're, you're an amplifier. You're an amplifier for their voice. I hope and so. That's, yeah, that's, that's the, the thing. But, I mean, it's doable, but, I mean, it's taken us 20 years. I think you can do it in less time. Um, um, if you can find what we're doing that might work for you, you won't have right. to be 
you know, starting from scratch. You can go, oh, I can see how they did that. That wouldn't work here, but it might work if we, you know, did this, you know? Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure, for sure. Uh, but, yeah, if you can get if you can get a point of agreement um, and just accept that people are going to go, yeah, but that means this and that'll be that and what will happen here, people won't stay on message. You've got to go, yep, well, we can discuss that, but just the point of agreement. Do you agree that hunting with dogs is a legitimate cultural activity you know do you agree and if you can get that you can go right you've got a heads of agreement a, me- a memorandum of, of understanding you exist then and right then it's, it's what you deliver back to them that's going to determine how involved they get we've got to we've got to even do that within our own community you know you can't mm-hmm. have coon hunters um fighting with deer hunters or deer no. hunters you know deer houndsmen you can't have the deer houndsmen um, you know, at odds with the with the hog hunters or the big game hunters or whatever. You gotta yeah. we gotta bring this community together and then work on the outside community as well. See it, to to fight people, you have to dehumanize them. I was having a meeting with some government people uh yesterday and I was saying if you if we've got to fight an enemy, we dehumanize them. They're baby eaters, they're this, they're that, the other, so that then you can um, treat them fairly harshly and not right. have any sort of issue morally with it because they're they're just animals. So right. and that comes from a lack of face to face discussion. So people even uh, people who are who are racist will still say, oh all of those people they're they're hopeless. Oh I live next door <laughs> to a person of that race. They're a great person. But right. those other ones are hopeless and they'll still be racist about that particular race but their next door neighbor who mows their lawn and help give some vegetables and things over the fence he's a great guy you know right so what, what we've got to do is is all got to find ways of humanizing ourselves within our own communities um and with the outside community so and we do yep. that with communication and contact yeah well ned i appreciate your time it's morning there it's evening here the time that I was doing math, trying to figure out how we were going to pull this right. together and and uh, working across international time zones there, I definitely yeah. want to get back together with you. I really appreciate it. And you instigated this. You instigated. Yeah. You're the one You're the one that reached out to us and said, and to me and said, hey, I want to talk to you about how we're doing things here because we want to help. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what it's going to take for all, all of us to survive in the future. So. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. I appreciate the chance to talk, and I'm looking forward to working with you. We'll we'll find a way to make this work. No worries. Don't worry about that. We'll 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 find a way. All right. Download that right. WhatsApp. Download that WhatsApp on your phone, and then yeah, you can I'll just you can just call me. Yeah. We that's can just chat on the phone. Concept. Yeah. Good. All right. It's better than having to look at me. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. I'll I'll talk Ned, to you soon. You take care. And I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, mate. See you later. All right. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of the Hounds from XP podcast. I appreciate you tuning in. And uh, just like Ned said, we can do this. We've got to do it. We don't have a choice. Um, let's just find that common ground. We said it in a Facebook post. It's real simple. We're, we're looking for people who value ter- hunting with dogs. And that's all we're looking about. If you like turning a dog loose to chase critters, at that, then we're here for you. That's what that's what Houndsman XP has always been about. And that's what we're trying to build with the National Houndsman Alliance. And it's great to hear. We've got friends across the big pond like Ned Makem and the Australian National uh, Pig Doggers and, and Hunters Association. So make sure you check out all their stuff on Facebook. Follow them. And if you see something there, then reach out to me. Reach out to me and say, hey, Chris, have you seen what they're doing over there? This could work here, maybe. We need all hands on deck. And I can't see everything. I can't be everywhere. And neither can any of our steering committee. So appreciate you tuning in. And until next week, this is Fair Chase.